Good morning. It's time for chapter three in uh, Where is Machu Picchu by Megan Stein. I hope you all are having a great day. Let's take a deep breath. Stretch out a little bit. And listen to our story. I've seen some really cool ideas that some of you have come up with for how to research South America, the maps you've done, some Lego palaces, and it's pretty cool. So keep those pictures coming and keep your creativity blossoming. All right, chapter three. It's easy to see why, Ma why Paca Pacchacuti would want a winter palace high up in the mountains. It was a perfect place to get away from the crowds in Cusco for one thing. It was also one of the most amazing spots for miles around. Filmy clouds draped the nearby mountains like scarves around a woman's neck. From this perch in the sky, Pachacuti could see the sun which he worshipped. He had, and, pre, and his priests could also track the movement of stars in the sky. And Machu Picchu was a safe place for a king to be with his family and friends. From the valley looking up, no one could see the small city. If enemies attacked the Incas, they probably wouldn't even know where the Inca was, king was living. Machu, Machu Picchu was a long way from Cusco, several days journey. Everything needed for life at the palace would have to be right there. So Pachacuti would need to build, build house, lots of houses for several hundred servants to live in. He would also need a place to plant crops to provide enough food for everyone. A steep mountainside wasn't the best place to plant fields of corn or potatoes. So what to do? The Incas were very good at engineering, at figuring out how to build things and make them work. So Pachacuti ordered his staff to create a series of terraces on which crops could be planted. Terraces are large, flat areas that go down a hillside like giant steps. First, the Inca workers had to dig out soil from the steep mountain slope. They had to remove enough for the, of the rocky dirt to create a flat area. Then they filled in the newly flattened space with layers of stone, gravel, and sand. Why? With a solid base under their plantings, the whole thing wouldn't wash away in the rain or be destroyed during an earthquake. Finally, they hauled rich soil up from the valley to the terrace. Here's a picture of their terraces. A few feet lower, just a little way down the mountain from that terrace, they built another terrace and another. Each terrace became a field for crops. Maize, another name for corn, Potatoes and bean were all grown at Machu Picchu. The houses and temples Pachacuti built were made of the finest white stone. The stones were found right there on the mountain. Workers may have dug some of them out of the ground or they may have just used huge boulders that had already broken free. They cut and shaped them without metal tools of any kind using rocks as hammers to chip away at the stone amazing use of our special hands and special minds. Pachacuti is said to have measured out the size for each building himself with a string. For the royal houses, the large stones were perfectly cut and fitted together. Some of the stones weighed as much as 14 tons. Moving them was incredibly hard work said the, since the Incas didn't have wheels or carts. For the servants' houses, the stones weren't as smoothly or carefully cut, but they were still strong. All the buildings were covered with thatched roofs made out of a kind of long grass. The royal houses were on the highest part of the estate looking down. Peasants and workers lived below. Pachacuti's own house was at the top with a wall all around it for privacy. His house was large, but not huge, a bit smaller than a modern basketball court. It wasn't fancy like a palace, but it was well protected with two gates made out of enormous stones to keep his enemies out. They 
The king's house had another special feature, a private bathroom. It was the only house at Machu Picchu with running water in it. Getting the water to the palace at Machu Picchu was tricky because of the mountain location. The only source of water was a spring high up on the slope, so the Inca's engineer, Inca engineers built aqueducts. Aqueducts are stone troughs or channels that carry water a long distance to where people live. At Machu Picchu, the aqueduct brought very pure water from half a mile away. It followed down the aqueduct and it into 16 different stone fountains. Then it shot out like a jet. Since Pachacuti lived at the top of the estate, the water flowed to him first. No one had touched the water before it reached him, so it was at its purest. More than a hundred members of the royal family could stay at Machu Picchu with as many as 500 servants. Outside the estate, there were smaller houses for people who had been conquered by Pachacuti. They were probably slaves. What was life like at Machu Picchu? For the king, a man who loved nature, each day was spent enjoying the beauty of the world around him. For his many servants, it was a life of hard work carried out in a very beautiful place. Go ahead and read chapter four as well. The buildings at Machu Picchu are in ruins now. The roofs are gone. So are most of the personal items the king would have used while he was alive. But scientists can still figure out how Pachacuti lived and what he thought was important. How? By looking at the way he chose to build his most beautiful private retreat. The most important thing in Pachacuti's life, at least while he was at his winter palace, was his respect for nature. So all of the religious buildings at Machu Picchu were designed to include parts of nature in their structure. Sometimes a temple was built right into the side of a mountain, or a gigantic natural rock would become an altar with cut stones added to the base. The temples were also designed so that Incas would have views of the constellations from their windows. Astronomers, people who study the stars and planets, helped figure out where the windows should go. Each day, the priests at Machu Picchu would perform ceremonies to honor the sun and moon, moon gods. The main temple is thought to have been designed so that one window lined up with a view of a cluster, a view of the cluster of stars called the Pleiades in the morning sky. Another window was positioned so that on the shortest day of the year, which is in late June, the sun would shine through onto an altar in the center of the floor. That day is called the winter solstice. Special ceremonies were held on the winter solstice in Pachacuti's time, and the solstice is still, still celebrated today. hoping to talk about solstices more in our lessons too soon. Here's a quick little lesson on it. Winter and summer in South America. Because the earth travels around the sun on a tilted axis, the top half and bottom half of the globe have winter and summer at opposite times of the year. Most of South America, including Machu Picchu, is in the bottom half of the globe. The colder winter weather of winter arrives during the months of June, July, and August. Summer comes in December, January, and February. When it's summer in Machu Picchu, it's winter in New York City, and vice versa. But even in winter, the weather in Peru is pretty mild. The average temperature in Machu Picchu is about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. It stays sunny, dry, and cool. It never snows in Peru except on the mountaintops. That's pretty cool. Rainbows often appeared in the sky at Machu Picchu and they still do today. The Incas believed that rainbows had magical power. They helped the Inca king talk to the sun god. So the temp main temple at Machu Picchu was built in the shape of a rainbow with a curved wall. 
Some warriors also had pictures of rainbows on their shields. Pachacuti loved flowers and sang songs about them. People sang, he say he sang a song about the lilies as he was dying. Today, more than 90 kinds of orchids from Pachacuti's time have, found, have been found still growing at Machu Picchu. The king spent much of his time outdoors hunting. He and his guests captured alpacas and llamas, which lived even higher up in the mountains. They hunted smaller animals and deer and deer. The meat from hunted animals was eaten at feasts and celebrations for the workers. Llamas and alpacas were usually kept as herd animals, but were also eaten as meat. The wool from the alpacas was woven into the softest clothing worn only by the royal family. Sometimes they used an animal as part of a ritual sacrifice. They killed the animal and then offered it to the sun god. There were enough servants at Machu Picchu to provide anything the king might want. Some wove textiles from the alpaca wool, others made gold and silver jewelry. The gold came from a mine in Peru. Even today, Peru has one of the world's largest gold mines. Shaw, spin, shaw pins made of bronze or silver were also popular. They were long tapered metal pins used to hold a shaw closed since the Incas didn't have buttons. Pa Pachacuti probably spent the winter months from May through September at Machu Picchu. Then it was time to make the long journey down the road back to Cusco. The Inca kings needed to spend much of the year in the capital city to run the government. They had to be there in case anyone tried to take over their empire. In 1532, Spanish invaders did just that. So we'll learn about the invaders tomorrow. There's one more little thing about llamas and alpacas that I'll read to you. Llamas are smart, gentle, woolly animals that live in herds. They're related to camels and are used to pack as pack animals to carry heavy loads. Llamas can be trained easily, but if they don't like something, they'll spit at it. Their green spit comes up from the contents of their stomachs. It can fly up to 10 feet away. Llamas weigh about 400 pounds. They're six feet tall at the tops of their heads. Alpacas are softer, woolier, and smaller. Their fine wool comes in dozens of different colors. Alpacas are in the camel family too, which means they're in the spitting family. Watch out. So there's a couple of animals you could do some research on. There's a picture of the pins that they would made for their shawls since they didn't have buttons. All right, so I have a million ideas of some follow-up work. Um, you could do some things in nature. I think I might do some nature drawings today inspired by Pachacuti's love of nature and my own. You could do research on alpacas and llamas. You could do research on gold. We were just doing some mineral and rock research in our classroom and I think Miss Suzanne read a book about that that's also been posted on YouTube. You could do some research on their winter and summer solstices uh, which we'll be giving some lessons on. Lots of exciting things so I hope you guys come up with some great ideas and I can't wait to hear about what you've learned. Bye!